child of the earth and sun, let my love wash over you. Let my love wash over you. I behold you, O oh beautiful one. I behold you, child of the earth and sun. Let my love wash over you. Let my love wash over you. I behold you, O oh beautiful one. I behold you, child of the earth and sun. Let my love wash over you. Let my love wash over you. Do we have any harmonies out there? I behold you, oh beautiful one. I behold you, child of the earth and sun. Let my love wash over you. Let my love wash over you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to your neighborhood Unitarian Universalist congregation. My name is Suzanne. I'm here to share with you the active life of this community and how you can be involved. Neighborhood has a new accessibility committee with Beata, Gail, Kurt, and Helen. We're taking action to dismantle barriers related to ableism. This is eighth principle work. If you're disabled or chronically ill, please share what you need to feel more welcome here at NUC. You can email Helen Armstrong. Helen's here today. There's also a comment box under the screen in the cappuccino to leave your ideas. Attention all members. There is a bylaw meeting after service today. We need two thirds of the membership to vote to pass the recommended amendments. Shouldn't take too long, I imagine, so please stay for the bylaw meeting. Walk in the footsteps of Susan Croft, steward of our planet, carbon footprint reduction educator, and advocate for the three R's. Friends of Susan are invited to gather and honor her memory on Sunday, November 10th. We'll meet after service in the cappuccino room and head to Withrow Park, picking up trash. Meet at the fire pit at Withrow Park at one. Learn the teachings about water, water walk, nibby song and then come back here to pick up more trash, enjoy veggie chili and date squares and share memories. You can RSVP to Lauren or speak to Lauren directly after service who's here today. Uh, there will be a screening of where olive trees weep. No one is free until we are all free. Here in the sanctuary, Friday, October 25th. Doors open at seven for a 7.30 screening. Following the screening, there will be time for discussion. Uh, the first, this first film is open to DMC members only. It's a private screening. You can speak to me, music at nuc.ca for more info. The Danforth Multifaith Commons is hosting a multifaith marketplace and fair on Sunday, December 8th from 2 to 5. We are looking for people who are interested in selling art and crafts that day. Um, and $100 needs to be the outside limit for any one item. If you would like to have a table, please contact Laura by October 31st for more info, and Laura is here today. You can speak to her after service. In our galleries, we have Just Love by Christopher Emanuel on the West Gallery, and Portals by Georgina Lee Walker in our East Gallery. 
The show runs until November 17th, and you're welcome to view it today after service or any time during the week. Can you help out in the munch room in our kitchen? There's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board next to the kitchen where you can indicate which Sundays you're interested and available to help. Uh, you can help out before or after the service or simply by donating a sweet or savory item. Uh, Gathering Sparks is doing a concert here in our sanctuary on Saturday, October 19th at 7.30 p.m. Gathering Sparks is Eve Goldberg, who runs the ukulele orchestra on Thursday nights, and Jane Lewis, who um, co-facilitates Circle Song with me on Sundays. You can get your tickets online or at the door. Uh, and I turn to John now for an announcement from the fundraising committee. Thank you. You're welcome. So our silent auction goes live less than three weeks uh, from today uh, on Saturday, October 26th. So uh, if you have any um, gifts, you can start bringing them in. And we're going to put, be putting them in the youth room. So uh, and, and if you have any questions on what you'd like to donate, uh, please ask myself or Pat McVeigh. Email us or ask us, ask us a service. Pat's not here today, but she will be next week. And uh, also, if you haven't done so yet, please uh, ask your, your favorite local business where you do business with if they'd like to make a donation. And we have our, uh, our poster and business letter on, at the back. If you haven't got one, please pick one up after service today. Thank you, Suzanne. Thanks, John. Putting the fun into fundraising. Now we're still looking for some help for our communications committee. Ongoing projects include our website, announcements, content for the screen, and promotional materials. If you can help out in a small way or a big way, please speak to Tony, our president, who's also here today and could speak to after service. Thanks, Bruce. Grieving the loss of our beloveds, Susan Crofts, Maggie Cambanis, and Doug Crozier. Every Wednesday evening for the month of October at 7 p.m., Anna DeFelice and Rev Sally will hold space on Zoom for anyone who would like to briefly check in, name intentions, memories, share stories and hopes, and spend some time in meditation or a quiet prayer. Together we will encircle each other and those we love in care and communal blessings. And that is at our regular Sunday Zoom. Living with loss and longing, a Saturday night movement service. The movement services are a new initiative here at NUC. We will have four of them as a trial for this year. The first being October 26th, 2024. 6.30 to gather, at 7 p.m. we'll have speaker, practice, and ritual. Going into 8.30, a DJ ecstatic dance with a closing circle at 10 p.m. Dealing with loss is a muscle that we need to exercise to get strong. Our services are created by our staff and volunteers. Reverend Sally Fritchie is our minister. Today, Melina Bondi is our guest speaker. Suzanne Mazars, that's me, your music director. Julia Thompson's our lifespan learning director. Moira McDonald is our service weaver today. And Bruce Line and Natalie Zen are handling our AV desk and Zoom. We thank all our greeters, money counters, LL volunteers, and coffee committee, all of whom are named in our cappuccino room. And next Sunday, our last service on the topic of love. It will be a community wisdom service. The speakers will be us, will be you. Music will be provided by our spirit choir. Our service weaver will be Gordon Thorne and Time for All Ages with Julia Thompson. Thanks, Suzanne. Good morning, everybody. Hello. Hi, welcome to our Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist congregation, hello. Thank you for joining us, whether you are here in person in the sanctuary or out there in Zoom land. Uh, we appreciate your presence. 
My name is Moira McDonald. I'm your service weaver this morning. We can all help to weave this service uh, as a community by being present, turning off unnecessary electronics and other um, noisy things. Sometimes we, we do need them to be part of the service, but if you don't, then please turn them off. And we can also do this by just taking a deep breath together. And let's do that now. Please join me in reading our opening words projected above me. Let us cast the circle of a sacred space here. Let us cast the circle of a shared space here. A space of safety, a place of forgiveness, a place of love. If you want the world to change, we must craft in our space and in ourselves the seeds that grow a different kind of life, a life of graciousness, of creative intelligence, a place of life and spirit for ourselves and our families. I'd like to invite Calvin Drake up to light our chalice, please. This morning's prelude will be offered by Suzanne. Thank you, Moira. I'd like to share with you a hymn, actually, from our hymnal, uh, with words rewritten by a Unitarian. It's a song that talks about the power of friendship, the power of community in times of pain and in, of struggle. I will sing, I will sing. 
sing with thanks unto the end. I will sing with thanks unto the end. I will sing. Thanks for that. I'm grateful to join with you today on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, as well as the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat and Haudenosaunee peoples, and home over time to many Indigenous and First Nations people, including the Anishinaabek, Inuit, and Métis. This land keeps me in connection with what is real and true, and that is all of life. I will strive to honor it and the gift of being here by treading as lightly as I can upon this land, listening to the stories and truth of those whose people were here long before my own, and acting on what I learned with respect integrity, and with love. Parents with children may want to take advantage of our optional wiggle room, which is at the rear of our sanctuary. Um, it is a place where you can hear, but you can make any sounds you like, and we will not hear you. Um, and it's not that we don't want to hear you, but if you don't want to be heard, that's the place. The room is also a quiet personal space if you need that at some point during the service. We also have assisted listening devices and they are available at our sound desk which is at the back there if you would like to try them out. We are open to many beliefs and we learn from many traditions. We welcome all people who are looking for a spiritual community. If you are visiting us in person for the first time, we welcome you and we encourage you to stay after service for snack time, beverages, hot and cold. We have red mugs and the tradition is if you pick up a red mug, it's a signal to others that you are newer here and you're curious and might want someone to strike up a conversation with you. Um, and, and maybe share a little bit about what we're all about. Our services do vary from week to week, and we encourage you, if you are new, to sample a few of the services just to get to know um, who and what we're all about. And we like to experiment and be creative. Our mission here at Neighbourhood is to empower spiritual growth and shared action for the uh, care of our world. We have themes for the year and for roughly six week cycles uh, this year. And this year, our theological theme uh, for, for the entire year is love is at the center. And our current six week cycle, the theme is love. Because why wouldn't you start off a year of love with love? There is a whole lot of love in the world, at least I, I notice it, but it also seems more and more that that love is drowned out by forces and voices of anger, fear, hatred, and violence. It can be hard to keep our footing, to remember why we love, why we want to love, and how to love despite everything going on around us. It can be hard to unlearn old patterns and reactions to be the people we want to and are meant to become. And I wrote that speaking of myself. As I stand here today on the 6th of October and the eve of October the 7th, I am conscious that there are parts of the world that are in deep pain and suffering that are desperately in need of that love that I speak about. 
and of the space that is required so that the human capacity for love, our capacity, can shine through. May that be so. I look forward to our guest speaker, Melina Bondi's message later about love as action, love as skill, love as gift. And in the words of the poet, potter, and writer M.C. Harris, love is not a doctrine. Peace is not an international agreement. Love and peace are beings who live as possibilities in us. So let's start to kindle that fire of love and share that with our neighbors around us. I invite you to greet the neighbors around you here in the sanctuary and also the people who are in Zoom land through that dark camera up there beside the, the bright light. And after uh, we're all done, you'll hear a chime and that will be your signal to return to your seats. Please return to your seats. When I heard that the theme today would be love as action and thinking about what songs to do, the song that came to mind was Answering the Call of Love, because the song rose out of love as action. If you look in our hymnal, it was originally called Standing on the Side of Love. And Jason Shelton, who wrote the song, received a feedback from the disability community saying that although they also support love, they cannot stand on the side of love. And would he consider changing that lyric? And he has to answering the call of love and has asked UU congregations near and far to strike through your hymnals with a black marker those lyrics to replace with answering the call, which I have done in my <laughs> in mine and i know you're not using uh hymnals today but also have struck some i see lauren you have one feel free take this is from the composer to strike it out so it is never sung this way again so i invite you to rise in spirit to sing with me answering the call of love Reflect. 
actions of grace in every embrace, fulfilling the vision divine. We are answering the call of love. Hands join together as hearts beat as one, emboldened by faith. We dare to proclaim we are Bear with me here, sorry. Okay, this is this one is kind of let me just yeah, let me just stretch this out. I think this is gonna work. Okay. Yeah, okay. Lighter it is. <laughs> the only problem is sometimes I have trouble with lighters. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, okay. Yay. All right. <laughs> that was a little bit of um, fun drama before we got started. So, Cameron, do you want to come? We're expecting other kids, but they're not here yet. So, I was almost late uh, getting here. Ha, huh. and here is my story. Yes. So I got out of the subway train and I walked along the platform and for some reason my heart was just feeling heavy. I don't know why. So I walked, I scuffed my feet, my shoes, walk, scuff, walk, scuff, if you want to do it with me, walk, scuff, walk, scuff. And then I got to the stairs, and I heaved myself up the stairs. Heave, thump, heave, thump, heave, thump, heave, thump. You get the picture, right? So when I got out, I'm going to need that in a minute. When I got out onto the street, though, huh, I couldn't, I, I got lost. I was looking for our building, and there was this fog swirling around, and instead of a neighborhood, there was this huge, tall mountain. Yes, just like that. It's a hat. Yes, and it could be a hat. And then I thought, I had an idea. I thought, if I climb this mountain, and if I get to the very top, maybe, I would be able to spot neighborhood. And then paradise, yes. So I got to work. And I started to climb this mountain. I, I climbed and I climbed, and then I fell. And then I climbed and I climbed and I fell again. And I thought, OK, I'm never going to get to the top of this mountain if I keep on falling. So, I decided to make myself a very useful, what do you think I'm making? Walking stick, yes, a very useful walking stick. And with my walking stick, I was able to walk along and walk along. But after a while, the sun came out, and it actually began to hurt my head. So, I made myself... Can I borrow this? I'm, I'm just... Why are you <laughs> All right, I will make my hat. So, I made myself a very useful... What? Hat. Sun hat. And as I was making...
waking my son had, I was thinking about how soon my head would be protected from the sun. So let's see if this works. So with my very useful sun hat, We might have to kind of use our imaginations a bit. It doesn't work. At least it'll be a, a paper protect. Could you pass me my walking stick? That, that's, that's the one I made. Oh, could you? Could I? Oh, all right. Did you make this one? <laughs> I made this one. Let's get this our walking uh, stick straight. We don't want to mix up our walking sticks. So with my hat and my walking stick, I continued along my way up, up the mountain. After a while, though, I began to feel very, very hot. So I made myself, what am I making? A very useful fan. And as I was making my fan, I was thinking, oh, I'm going to be able to cool off with my fan. Yes, it's, it's, well, it's going to keep, it's, hopefully it'll work. I was going to cool, we're going to cool off with our fans and we're going to finish our trip up the mountain. Ah, this was so much better. Now, I got to the top of the mountain, finally, and this beautiful butterfly appeared. Thank you. It appeared. It, whoops, I didn't even need my hat anymore because there were some trees on the mountain. Wait, what? Why, why is your, you just made that up. And besides, true, and besides, I could cool off now. But the butter, the fan turned into a butterfly and it did this lovely, joyful dance. You're doing it around me and it settled on my shoulder. shoulder. Now you can fly. Uh, I will. And it was so peaceful up there with my butterfly friend that time seemed to stand still. And I just, I took such delight in everything around me. I don't know how long or how short that moment was to a double. I don't know how long or short that time was, but I just know that I remember thinking to my, saying to myself, because sometimes I talk to myself, Julia, you need to take more moments like this, and then you'll be able to keep your heart wide open. Right, Suzanne? Right, Suzanne? <laughs> and by the time my butterfly flew away, I was just feeling so much better. But then I suddenly realized, I'm going to be late for the time for all ages, and people are just going to be sitting here. And I thought, OK, what am I going to do? Um, OK, I need to. The reason I climbed this mountain is I wanted to look down. And I looked around me, but I couldn't. Everything was too far away. So I made myself a very useful pair of how did you know I was going to say that? Because I looked at the card. Oh, my cheat sheet. <laughs> A very useful pair. You don't miss anything, do you? Of binoculars. Oh, that's, yes, and you took your job very seriously. I really appreciate it, Cameron. So with my very useful pair of binoculars, these must be magical binoculars because I was able to see all of you. How did that happen? And I thought, oh, okay, okay, how am I going to get there? How am I going to get there? I need to do something. I need to do, okay, all right, let's do this. So I got to work, and what did I do? What did I make in order to get there very quickly? A very useful paper airplane. Let's hope I can do this. All right. A solar. 
And as I was making this, we, we're going to make this after. We're going to make this. We're going to go through the story and make these in the rainbow room. So, with my very useful airplane, I counted to three. Count with me. One, two, three. And with my airplane, I zoomed off to neighborhood. And here I am with my heart wide open. <laughs> Thank you, Cameron. And now we're going to, with our lantern, we're going to let the lantern lead. And I'm grateful to Christine for helping me. Thank you. This is my solar-powered airplane for later. <laughs> Except I can't fold, fold to save my life, so I don't think I'm going anywhere with that. Um, so uh, we occasionally have something called question to the community. We know there is a lot of wisdom in our community, and we like to have opportunities to share it. So this morning, we have a question to the community. And it is, um, how have you experienced love as a skill or as a practice? Um, and some of us may have attended, Natalie Zen uh, did a wonderful service near the start of September about the four abodes, um, which um, is, is part of Buddhist wisdom. Um, those are loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy and equanimity or sympathetic joy and equanimity and we had an opportunity to actually try to experience that by moving around in our sanctuary. I know not everybody was there and um, not everybody who was there may have remembered what that was like. So um, I'm going to ask for a few um, a few responses back on this question, whether you were there or not, remember or not, how have you experienced love as a skill or as a practice? Tempest. Can I stay sitting down? Of course. Thank you. Um, it's a little hard to put words to at first because I've always been a follow your heart kind of person. But in the last few years, I've put the words to it that I live life with love as my touchstone. And the idea of this practice for me is that I, it, it takes a lot of faith and trust of that if, even if I don't know all the variables and all the logistics and, and there's all these things I can't control, if I make my choices in life, everyone, big and small, with love at the center, if I make them aligned with love, then I am able to trust to a, a great extent that I will end up in a place where I'm living a life full of love, even if I can't imagine what that looks like yet. Thank you. Someone else. Chris. He's thought a lot about this, I think. <laughs> He's got art. It's up there. <laughs> uh, yes, someone told me I was an artifist. I like that. So I experienced love recently with a friend of mine who is almost a fundamental Christian. But we get together and we made a conscious decision not to talk about certain things and we just, that we don't agree on. But we speak about the things we agree on and we share that and we focus on that. And we have a wonderful relationship because of that. Thank you. I'll head over to the other side. David. Thank you. Um, for myself, um, I've come to realize over the past year that love isn't necessarily unicorns and rainbows and pixie dust. It can be kind of gritty and messy at times. And 
trying to be present for in a compassionate way for those in my life, in particular with my family members who uh, who have been dealing with various things, my brother in particular with his health, and my mother who's there to care for him in the midst of all of this. And, you know, I have a complicated relationships with these people, but at the same time, trying to be present and trying to be, you know, available in whatever capacity um, has become a, a, a has become more of a practice for me in the past year. So I'll go with that. Thank you. Uh, maybe one more? Um, I found that love is not always easy. Sometimes it is a difficult practice. Sometimes it is fighting through waves of fear and pain and heartbreak to reach that love. And I found that it is always worth doing. Nice, thank you. Thank you for all of your ideas. And uh, I know there's a lot of wisdom here about that. So um, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Melina Bondi, uh, for those who have not heard them before. Melina is a queer, gender-fluid white settler who began meditating 20 years ago in both the Insight and the Plum Village traditions. In 2012, Melina was ordained by Thich Nhat Hanh, living uh, in Plum Village Monastery in France and in Blue Cliff Monastery in upstate New York. They left monastic life in 2021 and now work as a registered psycho psychotherapist and a meditation teacher with an orientation towards embodiment, social justice, creativity, and radical compassion. Melina is a longtime friend of Neighborhood and we are so happy to have them with us again. I invite Melina up to um, share their message of inspiration and also lead us in meditation. Melina. Melina. Thank you, Maura. Thank you, everybody. Very happy to be back and to meet some new folks and see a bunch of folks that I've had the chance to meet before. Um, so yeah, I had a chance to watch the recording of Natalie's service that introduced this theme that I'm going to continue on. It was really beautiful, and the, the milling practice is one I haven't done in years, but it's, I know it's really powerful, so I'm so happy for those of you who got to participate in it. And a little plug for those who didn't, the recording is there. <laughs> um, you can sort of follow along on your own if you'd like to, to dive into that. It's really worthwhile. Um, and so, as I said, I'm going to continue on this theme because when Moira reached out about doing a service about love, my brain went directly to, well, there's these practices that I've been doing for 20-some years and they're amazing. Um, and of course, other people would find them amazing too. <laughs> so, hence Natalie's sharing, I'm sure. Um, I first learned this practice in 2004, three or four. I was on a retreat in this very bare-bones facility. We were in an actual, it was a tent was our meditation hall. And every night after long days of sitting and walking and sitting and walking, we would end with a loving kindness meditation. And the first day we sent it towards ourselves and then towards our benefactors, then towards people we felt neutral towards, then towards people that were a little difficult. And this was, as I said, 2004. And none of us were American, but on the last night, um, the leader said, and now we're going to send people to we consider our enemies. So for some of us, that's going to be George W. Bush. And I remember my eyes flying open and thinking like, what? He does not deserve kindness. You know, I was, I was very opposed to that idea at the time. I was actually kind of enraged. Um, and so not only had I spent like this beautiful week of learning this loving kindness, but then it was the loving kindness that like, really triggered and upset me. And I was like, what on earth is this about? Um, and that combination of the beauty of the practice and the shock of it really got me to dig deeper. I mean, like, what is this about? And fortunately, this wasn't fully silent, so we had conversations amongst ourselves and were able to kind of grapple and argue. And um, eventually, the leaders were really clear that, you know, 
when we're practicing this kind of love, this isn't I want you to be happy and go have a margarita and do whatever the heck you want kind of love. This is I want you to be free from greed, hatred, and ignorance. And if you're free from that, you're going to stop bombing people. You're going to stop exploiting people. So we can actually offer this to any and everyone if we so choose. Um, it's, uh, it's which Natalie also pointed to a little bit in the in the talk. Um, so who was it that said this gritty and messiness of, of love? I, I, I fully <laughs> agree with bringing those terms into how we practice love. Um, and so the, the framework that the Buddhist traditions offer of this fourfold task, kind of, we have a different fourfold task too, but can we have the first slide? Um, just to put the words up to help everybody who wants to look at these and think about them. Um, yes, so the Pali word of metta translates as loving kindness or friendliness or care. And then karuna translates as compassion. I like to bring in tenderness and courage because we really need both the, the soft and the fierce aspects. Um, mudita is the sympathetic joy or borrowed and shared rejoicing. And upekka is the equanimity or spaciousness and inclusivity. Uh, the next slide, please. And sometimes people hear this list, but if you haven't had a chance to study it more deeply, you might not know that they're meant to work together, not just sequentially, um, but in really every combination possible. And my favorite image is of this diamond where we have this foundational care of connecting to people in the metta. And this sort of overarching, aspirational, but they're all aspirational, uh, the, the spaciousness or the equanimity of not getting stuck in our reactivity that, that hold almost as like bookends. Um, they hold our practice of love, some support and, and containment. And then we have these also very connected compassion and joy, which really is such a deep teaching on the importance of both leaning into where there's suffering, where it's hard, and seeking to relieve the suffering, and equally leaning into the good, noticing the beautiful things to celebrate, the butterflies on our shoulders, uh, the gifts, the grace of, of, of the love, um, and the goodness that does exist if we train ourselves to see it. We need to cultivate all of these, because if you get a little more heavily balanced in one than the others, we're gonna get really off balance. Our hearts will either get closed, we'll get burnt out, um, fall into anxiety, depression, a lot, of, a lot of difficult states. And so part of why I like sharing these together is that, especially if you've only heard of loving kindness, because it's kind of popular in some ways, it might seem like, well, that seems nice, but doesn't that make you uh, ready to be taken advantage of? Or like, you just, you can't be kind to everybody. And that's not the point. But with these four sort of compass points to keep checking our directions, our intentions, and most importantly, like, how are our hearts doing? <laughs> um, am I feeling out of balance? Am I feeling too tight? Or am I feeling too all over the place? Um, it's given me so much help through the years to kind of keep just checking in, rebalancing, resetting. And so there's a series of phrases that I just found incredibly beautiful, which is the third slide I'd like to have us. Uh, I'm just going to read it out, and um, this isn't our formal meditation, but if you do want to contemplate a person in your life, a situation, or even a part of yourself that's hard to love, you can just kind of contemplate this as I read these phrases. Metta, or kindness, is the love that connects it's an antidote to all forms of aversion. But it is not attachment. It doesn't cling and stick. If it slides into sentimentality, though, karuna or compassion brings the heart back into balance. Karuna is the love that responds, responds to suffering. It's an antidote to cruelty. But it is not pity, because that is distant. 
it slides into sorrow or overwhelm, then mudita brings the heart back into balance. Mudita is the love that celebrates as an antidote to envy. It is not competition. If it slides into agitated, ungrounded excitement, then upekka equanimity brings the heart back into balance. Upekka, the love that allows, is the antidote to partiality. It is not indifference. But if it slides into disconnection, then metta, love and kindness, brings the heart back into balance. And so this is a bit about love as skill and as action. And I know the time is brief, but I also wanted to name love as a gift. Because when we think of love only as skill and action, it can become transactional. Um, And yet there are gifts of love to be received in every moment. We often think about this on the human realm, but I find it really helpful to expand beyond the human realm, the, the gravity that actually holds our bodies on this earth that holding can be seen or understood as love. The air that breathes us, that keeps us alive in every single moment, gift of life, how can that not be love? Love of creation for each of us creatures. Our nervous systems are constantly trying to protect us from pain no matter how effective or ineffective that may be in each moment, there is that impulse to protect us from pain. How can that not be love? Most of the time, we don't hurt each other. How can that not be love? And so learning to recognize the love that is being received, offered freely as a gift in every moment, is I think the most important practice that we can do, but also then it allows us to give love freely. And someone named love as being available, being available to actually receive what's being given as well as to offer goes hand in hand. And so my my own practice of these boundless qualities these days is both very internal and external. It's more and more learning, not just to try to be neutral with the anxiety and the numbness and hopelessness that I experience, but to actually love it, which is very hard and very freeing, very worthwhile. Uh, and then to, to practice the fierce compassion that can, that can see injustice and say no with love. Um, so yesterday I spent many hours marching, <laughs> um, uh, and my legs were aching, but, but I kept coming in like, okay, how can this be my prayer? Yes, if I just tune into that, that love that you were talking about, I think, that grounded as a foundation, a touchstone, um, then, yeah, my, dem- my showing up at a demonstration is an action of love. And my writing a newsletter <laughs> is an action of love. Um, and, and I have some DMs of people who don't agree with my stance that I'm getting ready to reply to as an action of love because I need to be ready. Um, so especially knowing, as more named, and I'm sure a lot of us are aware, it's been, tomorrow will be a year since the attacks of October 7th and the tremendous pain that ripped through the Jewish community as we're in the High Holy Days this year, and then the retaliatory genocidal violence that we've been watching and affected by, some more than others, some losing dozens of family members, so many deaths, that has been funded and armed by governments right here. Cannot not name that and also make a land acknowledgement 
can't work for decolonization here and not also name it elsewhere in the world. And it can be so overwhelming. And this is where I turn over and over again to the Brahma Viharas. Okay, how can my heartbreak let me break open? But am I also celebrating the joy? Or, wow, it's been a beautiful morning. Okay, do I have the energy to open it to a bit more of reality? And so I want to both um, share just a little, a few more words um, from Bell Hooks about the importance of this kind of love, and then offer a meditation that combines metta and equanimity for these times. Um, I guess the words from Bell Hooks I'm wanting to share just to encourage us to be open and courageous and radical and fearless in sharing love even if it seems like the world is just too hardened and bitter. Um, Bell writes, for a long time, many of my friends and peers had no idea that I was devoted to a spiritual practice. Among progressive thinkers and scholars, it was much more hip, cool, and acceptable to express atheistic sentiments than to declare passionate devotion to divine spirit. I was also worried that people would think I was trying to convert them and impose my beliefs if I spoke about this. But when witnessing the despair of my students, their sense of hopelessness, their fears that life is without meaning, their profound loneliness and lovelessness, I began to speak more openly about my spiritual practice. When young, bright, beautiful students would come to my office and confess their despondency, I felt it was irresponsible to just commiserate with their wills without daring to share how I had confronted similar issues in my own life. They would urge me to tell them how I sustained my joy in living. And to tell the truth, I had to be willing to talk openly about spiritual life. I had to find a way to talk about my choices that did not imply they would be correct or right choices for someone else. And still, I spoke about spiritual living and love. Okay, so we'll do a brief meditation, which can be in any posture. Uh, you don't have to even necessarily stay still, but if you can find whatever is stabilizing and supportive in your body, your eyes can be open, closed, really whatever supports you. And we call this intimacy and emptiness practice. And so we just start by noticing where our body is in contact with something that is holding us because that surface at some point is held by the earth. So can we receive this love of being held be available to receive the gift of life as we are breathing the air that sustains us. And let yourself maybe drop into awareness some other ways that you have received love. And the human kind and the cosmic kind. As you breathe in the care in, breathe in, let the care fill up. As you breathe out, let it permeate you. And here's the important point. If you have some care, some of this love to spare, we're going to let it flow out. But if you feel like you don't have any to spare, then just keep taking it in. We're not forcing anything here. But if there's some to spare, you can choose a person, a group, an ecosystem, somewhere to send this care and love.
And I'm going to offer a few phrases. You might silently repeat some of them. If they're helpful, you can drop the words or change them if that's more helpful. And this combines the kindness of loving of metta and the equanimity of upekka. I know that my good wishes and intentions cannot relieve you of your hardship, and still, I offer you love and care. I know that I alone cannot resolve all your difficulties, and still I send you peace and love to support you on your journey. Things may be different in the future, but now they are the way they are. And I still wish for wellness, freedom from ignorance, hatred, and greed. And it may not even feel possible to do this in this moment. So another practice is to just conceive of the possibility of feeling both the love and the spaciousness, the care and the acceptance, the discomfort of the paradox, the complexity of reality. As we learn to be more intimate within the emptiness or interconnectedness of all things. And so thank you for engaging in this practice, which for some I imagine is challenging. It's something to drop in and out of as you wish and as are you are able. And I thank you for being willing to try and for your listening. I invite you to stay in this place of open-heartedness, place of compassion and loving kindness to bring into your heart someone that could use some love right now. Maybe it's yourself, maybe it's someone in this room, maybe it's someone somewhere else in your life. And to hold them in your heart as we sing. I behold you, oh beautiful one. I behold you, child of the earth and sun. Let my love wash over you. Let my love wash over you. Will you sing with me? I behold you, oh beautiful one. I behold you, child of the earth and sun. Let my love wash over you. Let my love wash over you. One more time. I behold you.
Many layers to love. It's um, kind of a revelation to keep discovering new layers of love, even at the stage of life. Um, so another act of love that we do in our community is a, a practice of joys and concerns, offering our joys and concerns into this communal space. It's a unique time in the service. Um, and it is a ritual that, uh, because of the intimacy of it, we will edit, edit it out of the recording that we do of the service, just to preserve everyone's privacy. Um, so for joys and concerns, we have several ways that we will do it. Um, uh, and I'm just going to explain them first, and then, and then I will I'll cue everybody as we reach each stage. So if um, people have mobility challenges and would prefer to stay where they are, I will ask you to signal to me, and I'll bring the mic to you. And um, we'll have our, I have a wonderful assistant, Alison Kabayama, who's going to be holding the candles. And um, she'll light a candle for you. Um, after that, I will signal to anybody else who's in the sanctuary here to uh, form lines on, uh, in each of the aisles, and then we'll signal to you to come up, and you can light a candle and name your joy or concern. And then finally, we will turn to people on Zoom, and Natalie's end will help you with uh, naming your joy or concern, and we will light a candle for you here in the sanctuary. Joys and concerns, we do this together. Um, so let us create and sustain the sacredness of the ritual as a collective by speaking briefly about what is in our hearts and our spirits. We can leave stories or announcements for another place and time. Let us draw closer by making room and space for all so all can be heard. So, Allison, if you would come and um, if you would light a candle first um, for uh, all of our volunteer efforts, seen and unseen, that help our community to hold together. And we have a candle for a Unitarian um, that is William Dennison, who was a member of Toronto First Unitarian. There he is. He served as mayor of Toronto from 1967 until 1972, a Unitarian mayor. And he was also an environmental activist, and he worked to stop industrial polluters on Ontario waterways. Now is the time for our offertory sharing of ourselves as part of every faith. Volunteer efforts are essential and we are grateful for them. Rent and salaries are paid as well and programs need to be created and they are created through your contributions, your monetary contributions. So our greeters uh, will pass the baskets for those who choose to make contributions in the basket while Suzanne plays. Um, our congregation is a living entity and like all living things, it needs nurture and s sustenance. So uh, some of us do contribute by pre-authorized withdrawals. We thank you for that. As we contribute to the life of this community, we affirm our lives within it and we also have a website where you can donate online, including those of you on Zoom. The greeters, um, uh, you can bring liquid baskets to me once the collection is collected. And over to Suzanne. Uh, we're going to be singing a song of Melina's, so I've asked them to come up and give us some context. So these are some of the traditional words from the Buddha's discourse on loving kindness. And in 2012, when I was preparing to ordain, Thich Nhat Hanh was teaching a lot about this that winter. And then one day a melody appeared in my mind. So uh, that gift was received and shared, and it still gets shared today. So you can take it as a practice as well as a song. Thank 
you. Excellent. I'll teach it phrase by phrase. I'll sing a phrase, you sing it back to me. And once the baskets come in, we'll have a go at the whole song. So. May I be happy. May I be happy. May I be free from pain and suffering. May I be free from pain and suffering. May I live in peace and well-being. And 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 May I be free. May I be free. May I be happy. May I be free from pain and suffering. May I be happy. May I be free from pain and suffering. May I live in peace and well-being. And may I be free. May I live in peace and well-being. And may I be free. you. If you have found love and acceptance here, if you have found home here, if you have known kindred spirits here, let this offering be a token of gratitude for our common life as we build the common good. Can we get it to go back one slide, please? We're going to sing for I, we're going to sing for you, we're going to sing for we, and we're going to sing for all. Rise in spirit, please sing with you with me. May I be happy, may I be free from pain and suffering, may I live in peace and well-being and May you live in peace and well-being and extinguish our chalice and we will sing our chalice extinguishing song
us all to join together in a circle-ish kind of formation as best as we can make it. And I leave you with a blessing today by Robin F. Gray. May the flame of our community ignite a love bold enough to share and in return, may we all be embraced by a love that remains constant in times of sorrow and in days of great gladness. Go in peace, go in love. The service is ended. <laughs>